Welcome to another episode of the Africa Leadership Dialogues. It's always a pleasure to have you with us. Now this week we speak with Dr. Beatrice Kirubi. She's with Medicine Sans Frontier. We talk about health in conflict situations in Africa. You get to have your say as well on the issues. And we have Africa's top 10. You're watching the Africa Leadership Dialogues. I'm Julie Gishuro. Today we host Dr. Beatrice Kirubi and she has a medical degree from the University of Nairobi. She's currently pursuing a master's degree in public health but has over 10 years experience in the public service, private sector and the NGO sector as well. She's worked with Medicine Sans Frontier for over three years in Kenya and South Sudan in programs involving HIV, TB, sexual violence, maternal and child health, and response to emergencies. She's a member of several professional bodies, including the Kenya Medical Association and the World Health Organization, Afro Region Green Light Committee, that supports member countries in the implementation of tuberculosis and especially drug-resistant TB programs. Let's get her insights into Africa. Thank you very much for finding the time to be with us on the Africa Leadership Dialogues, Beatrice. Thank um, you for having me. A difficult conversation uh, this week, simply because while the Africa Rising narrative is, is, is one that we celebrate on this show, there are also serious situations of grave concern on the continent. Mm -hmm. And Medicine Sans Frontier, the organization you work with, is one of those organizations at the forefront of trying to assist in these situations. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about your presence across Africa right now, what you're engaged in, and, and in what countries. Medicines and Frontiers, or Doctors Without Borders, as it is known in English, um, is an organization that is uh, humanitarian, uh, that pro aims to provide humanitarian medical assistance um, to people who are unable to access it. And uh, it's basically looking at the vulnerable uh, population. And uh, currently we are in 70 countries worldwide and uh, over half of those are in Africa. Mm -hmm. So uh, in Africa, there, I mean, we're in s several countries uh, providing different kind of medical aid, humanitarian aid, and this is spread across uh, stable countries, like Kenya, for instance, and also unstable countries. And by unstable, I mean that there's some uh, sort of security or conflict uh, issue that's happening. In terms of uh, what we provide, mm -hmm. um, this is more, uh, I mean, it's uh, spread out and depends on the context. So MSF basically, being an independent organization, uh, carries out an assessment and decides that this is uh, dire enough for us to go in. The kind of programs we provide are also varied uh, based on the context. So for instance, we are found in conflict situations and uh, for conflict, I will say South Sudan for now. Central African Central Republic. Central African Republic. Mm -hmm. um, in these countries, we are providing uh, humanitarian medical aid uh, in terms of uh, providing care, uh, providing uh, consultation, general consultations, maternal and child health care, vaccination. Um, we are providing uh, just uh, access to essential items, you know. Uh, yes, food is an issue. But if you want to maintain dignity, which is part of humanitarian aid, uh, we also provide um, uh, non-food items, essential mm -hmm. non-food items. Mm -hmm. So MSF is also trying to get, for, for those who have been displaced in these countries due to various issues, for instance, in uh, CAR or even in South Sudan, we have uh, set up some camps mm -hmm. uh, where uh, we are providing medical aid and also screening for any other illnesses. So, so tell us about the challenges of, of dealing with human traffic mm -hmm. um, and, and human movement. Uh, are, you facing, are you facing those and what are you doing about it? Yes, we are. Um, with the current conflict in South Sudan, we are seeing, we have set up, MSF has set up um, 
a receiving post at the at the Nadapal crossing border point, and uh, we have received over 10,000 uh, arrivals. Uh, two other border points have been set up: one at at Nzipai um, in Uganda and Tirgol in uh, Ethiopia. And basically what you're seeing is uh, women and children, mainly women and children, and uh, in terms of their needs, it's uh, acute malnutrition, we have dehydration, we have uh, children who needed uh, vaccinations, who have uh, missed their vaccinations, but also just access to uh, non-food items also. Um, that help to you know to maintain their dignity, even if they're in a different uh, in a different uh, area. In a uh, difficult environment. Yeah, in a difficult environment. Mm -hmm. So um, that is uh, basically what we're seeing now. You you say it fairly simply, but the truth is, your doctors, your mm -hmm. statisticians, your 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 staff on the ground. Mm -hmm face grave danger on a daily basis, mm -hmm. um, trying to provide services. And we thank your teams and, and all other teams who are out there doing this in different parts of the continent. Mm -hmm. Let me now approach this from a personal perspective. Mm -hmm. You're a young African. Um, you've worked, for instance, in South Sudan. Mm -hmm. What does it make you feel in the midst of it when you look around and see this Africa that is yours, mm -hmm. this continent of yours, mm -hmm. and, and you're providing health care in such dire circumstances, what, what do you feel? Well, as you say, we've made great strides. Africa as a whole has made great strides in terms of, I would say, well, in other, in other areas, but also in terms of health. Mm -hmm. However, um, we still have a long way to go uh, in terms of uh, things that we can control and some that we cannot. Africa, for instance, still bears the greatest burden of HIV, um, if we look at uh, the, the general infections, Africa has 60% of uh, the, the burden of HIV. Africa has the highest, uh, over the, out of the 19 or 20 high uh, countries with high maternal mortality rates, Africa is mm -hmm. one of them. So this has, I mean, it has changed over the years. Things are getting better. However, there are other issues that, uh, uh, that uh, worsen or complicate the situation. Uh, one is, uh, if you look at uh, infrastructure, for instance, I'll talk about uh, South Sudan and MSF activities in South Sudan. There was an issue of access to care. Why? Because uh, of the infrastructure, because of the lack of uh, skilled workers, because of uh, just policy, uh, because of financing. So these are some of the issues that complicate health. Mm -hmm. Now, when you add conflict to this, it makes it even worse. It's fascinating that you've brought up infrastructure because mm -hmm. even, even in dealing on the ground in Turkana, I remember people saying, you know, with respect to food security, even where you have markets, mm -hmm. you can't access mm -hmm. those markets. Mm -hmm. um, that even insecurity issues are compounded, as you have said, mm -hmm. by infrastructure mm -hmm. challenges. So what would you say now? You have an opportunity to speak to policy makers and government what would you say in terms of the need to boost African infrastructure? One of the groups that we provide care for in Kenya is the urban poor mm -hmm. uh, in Madare, in uh, Kibira. MSF runs a project that looks at HIV, providing HIV care, TB care, and uh, sexual violence. Uh, we attend to victims of sexual violence. And uh, this is compounded by infrastructure. For instance, they have no access to clean water meaning that then they're more likely to get diarrheal diseases. They have no access to ventilated mm -hmm. uh, spaces. Mm -hmm. And so diseases like TB are likely to spread. So I think it is upon each one of us, plus the policy makers, to make, uh, if we want to prevent these diseases, then we need to improve on the infrastructure. But going further, uh, because some things can change today and others would not change. What are we doing in terms of educating the the vulnerable population or uh, empowering them more about uh, promotive health care services, about preventive health care services. I talk about, uh, for instance, uh, TB. So fine, there's a problem of infrastructure. We cannot move people out of the slums today. Uh, but what message are we giving the person who's uh, living, you know, in a small, uh, in a small shanty without windows? So this person has coughed for this period of time. So you want to ensure, okay, when you cough for this length of period, please go to a facility, mm -hmm. have yourself checked for TB, 
you know, such promotive, preventive measures that can be taken. Another one which is not necessarily controlled by the environment, but uh, by the is controlled by this environment, but security, for instance, mm -hmm. is uh, sexual violence. And I talk about uh, this as a major, um, it's something that uh, we, we are trying to, to, to look at uh, as MSF within uh, the, the urban slums. Um, in the last three years, our numbers have risen, for instance, from 50 to 200 sexu uh, sexu victims of sexual violence. I'd say, like for instance, in January we had 200 new, uh, new people or new, new victims. Yes, reported. Is, do you have any statistics or indication as to what is leading to this? I would say part of it is because of uh, the sensitization that has gone out to the community, and now they are able to report. report. But again, it is something that we need to work around. And as preventive promotive, it is how do we break the culture of silence? Right. Uh, how do we make sure that these people are not uh, you know, too timid to go out? So what MSF is doing is empowering the community and letting them know that, well, these facilities are available. If you come to this facility, we'll give you this treatment that will uh, protect you against this. It's also for the, for the community as a whole to take it up as part of their responsibility. Mm -hmm. Let's stay with sexual violence, sexual issues mm -hmm. for a short moment. South Africa, rape is, it's an epidemic. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen situations of violence um, actually uh, you know, increase the levels of sexual violence, but Rwanda somehow mm -hmm. has managed, it seems, to contain the sexual violence mm -hmm. in the country. What should African governments be doing mm -hmm. to address this situation? What did Rwanda do right? I would want to believe as a Kenyan that it's because we are reporting more. But probably there are other issues that are worsening this uh, situation. So can we go down and ask, or can we send uh, people down to the community and find out if there are any things, if, or if there are any factors that are exacerbating mm -hmm. this? Uh, I think that is the only way we can then address those issues. Other than what uh, comes out that, uh, for instance, um, this is a mother who has to work, has no, chil has no care caregiver to take care of her children, and sh so she leaves her children with the doors locked, and there are people hanging around and uh, she's exposed. That's one thing mm -hmm. where you see what happens to the mother uh, because she needs to go out and fend for her family, then exposes her child. If I may say, half of our, half of our cases are children. And Half of it, your rape cases are children. Are ch what ages? Uh, basically, I would say from the age uh, we've had even a two, four year old, but extending to 18, because in this country we know that there's nothing, I mean, it's not uh, allowed for eight, under 18 years mm -hmm. of age. So then it is how do you make sure that the environment is safe for the children? And what does, does it say about a society before we move on to that, <laughs> Beatrice? that children are being raped. Most people are actually violated by people known to them. So it is more what message do we give or how do we protect our children? How do you empower your child so that then they know that this is wrong, this is not right, but also how do you report it so that it does not happen? What we've tried as MSF is uh, to try and push the messages. So we have a team of community mobilizers and they go to the, to the community. Let your child know that this is okay and this is not okay. However should it happen, uh, this is the number to call. One thing I wanted to mention actually is uh, we realized that uh, part of the reason for patients not showing up or the victims of violence not showing up is that they were scared of either bringing it up or they had no means of getting to the facility. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that care needs to be given within a certain period of time. For instance, for HIV prevention after rape, it needs to be given within three days. So if this person cannot make it to the facility during those three days, then there's, a, I mean, uh, there's no use giving the preventive therapy. So, uh, so there's a number people can contact yes. to get the assistance? So we have a number mm -hmm. um, that we give out during the community mobilization. 
to ask them, okay, if you are in, or you know someone who has undergone this, give them this number and let them call us. And we have uh, ambulances on standby that retrieve these clients and bring them to the facility. Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. We've heard stories of commercial sex workers who say they are paid more to have sex without protection. Mm -hmm. um, knowing in many cases that this is a death sentence uh, because of HIV AIDS, again, it comes back to that big question of what's going on in our societies. And, and you talked about information. How, how do we change mindsets though? Because there's the ability to share information, but everybody knows what AIDS is. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows that if you have sex yeah. without a condom, well, many people know. Mm -hmm. So how do you go the next step and, and create mindset change? Mm -hmm. Actually, I think that is something that, uh, well, uh, you know, even the aid workers, for instance, in this uh, field of HIV have mm -hmm. noticed. It's something that when you hear, you do not want to believe in this day and age. Mm -hmm. You give people inf information and I think people have the information because by the time you know that you need to pay more for sex without a condom, it means that you're aware that that is a, a risk. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you that uh, in uh, 2012, we conducted a study in part of Nyanza looking at uh, HIV coverage, HIV um, indicators in terms of prevalence, who is more, who is more vulnerable. And it was more thinking, it was just this, this, the same question. So we've been giving, we've been having a lot of HIV interventions, mm -hmm. but why is it not changing? Why right. are we still having a, a lot of deaths, a lot of new infections, a lot of... Uh, uh, you know, uh, ch children some, yeah. born with HIV. with HIV. And in some countries in the world, mm -hmm. new infections are not exactly. seen. They simply don't exist. Exactly. So why, why in Africa? So when we carried the study, and we carried the study in uh, Homa Bay, part of Homa Bay called Ndiwa. And uh, well, for us it was strategic because we have, Homa Bay was actually one of the, it was the first site in Kenya to provide free ARVs. Okay. Uh, with the support of M MSF in 2001. And so it means that there has been this period of 12 years, 10 years, you know, with a lot of HIV in, in interventions. interventions. So when we looked at uh, the, the study results, it showed, well, I mean, the prevalence is high, meaning that one out of four people basically in that area has HIV. That's compared to, I'll, I'll move it away from uh, the town to this area because it's an area where Many actors in the field, whether MSF or other actors, have put in funds, but yet there is still a lot of HIV ongoing. One out of four had, uh, is, is actually a person living with HIV, whether they knew it or did not know, because we tested. Uh, we realized that young girls between the age of 15 to 24 are actually the ones who are getting more infected. So you can tell that, you know, these girls are uh, acquiring the infection very fast. And something that we, we measured that we haven't measured in this country before was incidence. Incidence just means how many n new infections mm -hmm. did we get during this period. And for this area, it was an incidence of 2.2. I say 2.2, 2.2 may sound like a small number, 2.2%, but it's actually one of the highest in the world. So meaning that yes, we are managing our patients, they are on care for those who are um, in the facilities, they are taking their drugs, but there is this group that is spreading the infection that is acquiring the infection. So for MSF, it was more, okay, we've been here 10 years, what can we do differently? And I think for all interventions, all HIV interventions among all vulnerable groups is just to look at what interventions are we doing, um, w what can we do differently. The, 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 you know, mm -hmm. just hearing that information and knowing that there's a group of people who simply don't care mm -hmm. and because of their lack of, of, of connection perhaps to community mm -hmm. are causing a huge problem 
for a whole society and young girls, again, it comes back to the children, are, are being impacted. Um, we'll come back to this issue before we close the show. But I want to touch on something that's not very often spoken about. Because of your experience on the ground in conflict situations, you see the worst impact um, on society. Let's just get graphic and tell people. In countries like Central African Republic, in countries where conflict is happening, what, what is the impact in terms of the greatest, the cause of death? What do you see? What do you see? If you're a doctor and you're receiving patients in a camp, paint the picture as painful as it might be for us. What is it that you see? I will talk about uh, CAR, the Central African Republic, because uh, that is an area of concern for MSF. Um, this situation is a bit different because you're looking at different players. There's a lot of ethnic, there's a lot of religious um, conflict. And uh, you get people uh, injured, for instance, from gunshot wounds, it's bullet wounds, it's uh, crude weapons, use of crude weapons, it's um, trauma. So that's the kind that you get. But don't forget they're the other silent group. For instance, women who have been uh, raped mm -hmm. or sexually violated as they come to the facility or just found in their homes and violated. For these conflict situations, it's more, how do you access the patient? It is difficult to access the patient. Um, it, it is difficult to bring the supplies to the patient. It is difficult to ensure, to guarantee, um, you know, safety of your healthcare workers. And even if you, their safety is guaranteed, what they see is traumatizing for them. On the other hand, it is also difficult to bring this, the population to the facility because they will pass through these unsafe areas to get to the facility. Moving from the, from the conflict area to the side of receiving, because in, in, uh, in Kenya, for instance, we have a post at uh, the border with uh, South Sudan. There's a border crossing area in Adapa, uh, where we receive uh, arrivals, from, uh, arrivals from South Sudan. And so far, since December, there have been about 18,000 arrivals. 80% um, are women and children. And these are women and children who have uh, walked um, for almost uh, a week. And again, for them, it was not an issue that they were not eating. They needed to flee the conflict. Mm, the priority and so to, to safety. Exactly. So they come and uh, they find themselves at the border point and uh, these people are dehydrated. They have some form of acute, acute malnutrition. Um, it's a child who, for instance, has not drunk or eaten for two days. And so when they come, they are, mal they are malnourished, but they're also dehydrated. Um, it's people who have lost their families as they were coming, you know. Mm. It's people who have witnessed, uh, witnessed uh, their family being killed or who so have been this, sexually violated. There's grief, there's trauma, there's exactly. on top of any, any physical. And not to mention that they were exposed, as they are coming, they're exposed to harsh weather, climate, mm. harsh, harsh weather factors. It is everyone's right to access um, medical care. It is everyone's right to access humanitarian aid. So MSF will uh, provide this for all the parties involved, or for the irrespective, for the, irrespective of, 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 of the different conflict situations, irrespective of what political you, stance, stance and, and whatever. And, mm -hmm. Um, what we ask of the leaders of these uh, two warring, uh, or the two opposite sides, is give us um, safe, of, safe passage. Just let us be able to provide the medical care that we need, offer security to let it be that it's secure for humanitarian aid to reach the patient and for patients to reach the point of medical care. That even as all this is happening, it is everyone's right to access medical care and humanitarian aid. You know, just yeah. to add to that, you know, we've done stories of, of women who have to use wheelbarrows to mm -hmm. get through the slum exactly. areas because yeah. there's no other way mm -hmm. to transport them to a health center, which mm -hmm. is which is an absolute nightmare. Mm -hmm. um, we, we're soon coming to the close of the show. I want you to share with us your vision for Africa. You're a health worker. Mm -hmm. What kind of Africa would you want to ideally work in? 
I think I will say that uh, every person, regardless of your background, regardless of uh, what uh, level socioeconomic status, has access to good access to good diagnostic and treatment and whatever kind preventive promotive service health service that is there as msf is also, we also try to push uh, for innovation innovation is that today you'll come and i'll do a prick and i'll tell you you have malaria it will reduce that the deaths by by a quite a considerable number um, so what i want to see, what i would like to see uh, is where we can access these services whenever we need them. Part of what I will uh, ask is in terms of policy. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that uh, healthcare right now is mainly funded by donors. Um, it is not something that the governments has, you know, are, uh, are uh, supporting as much. And uh, from the Abuja declaration, it was uh, that most governments needed to give a particular percentage, 15% to healthcare. And really, this is something that needs to be taken up, where governments take up the, you know, the, the financing of uh, healthcare. Mm -hmm. I would also want to make an appeal now, because of the current context, and say that uh, we are concerned about what is happening in the two countries, in uh, South Sudan and in Central African Republic. And we feel that uh, with the deteriorating humanitarian situation, um, there is need for more funding to mm -hmm. go to these areas. There is need for skilled humanitarian personnel because if you overwork those who are there, then you will end up with uh, the same uh, a worse situation. So certainly, a lot of attention goes towards you know um, you know providing the kind of uh, the military force, uh, the African presence of Amazon forces in many situations. Mm -hmm. um, we should also consider the health implications, what's being done, and that's an appeal that's been made by Dr. Beatrice Kirubi today. Very interesting that um, things are changing. Mm -hmm. As you've said, that there are gains as well. Um, when it comes to maternal health care, for instance, there's there's a, a Stand Up for African Mothers campaign that Grasha Machel is mm -hmm. the patron of from, mm -hmm. from uh, South Africa, but it runs right across East Africa mm -hmm. as well. Um, we've got also in East Africa, in Kenya, the Beyond Zero campaign mm -hmm. launched by the First Lady. I know the First Ladies of many African countries mm -hmm. are actually engaged in maternal health care issues um, you know we're seeing now a, an attempt to get to universal health care um, in some nations which, which would be a leap ahead for the continent how important though is skilled uh, labor how important is it to have more nurses and doctors and, and, and you know what would your appeal be there one there is the issue of training and this I think has improved over the years but then can we train them but also, can we work at retaining them? Mm -hmm. Because the retention is, a, I mean, it's a big thing. I would say that as Kenya, we have the capacity. And the reason I say that is, look at uh, what we are doing. Uh, I mean, look at, uh, for instance, in the HIV world, in the TB world. We started with offering, you know, uh, drugs. And, the, you know, the government took it up. At first, it was MSF buying the drugs. Now, the, gov the government took it up. Uh, we started with, uh, you know, policies here and there. Now we have policies in place. These are plus medical protocols. I think that in the same way for HR, we need to invest in retention, in retention uh, strategies that will keep our HR, our skilled workers in those areas where they're needed and not necessarily that they need to fend for themselves in the towns. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, if I may mention is a... Uh, we are handing over our HIV activities, for instance, in HIV in Homa Bay, uh, where we've been running a program for the last 10 years, over 10 years. And it's because we looked and we saw, okay, here there's, uh, there's a skilled HR, we just need to maintain them. There is, a, they, they have the capacity. So I think Kenya has the capacity, it's just that we need to learn how to redistribute what we have across. Um, that, that is good news. Mm -hmm. That is good news. That, that we are able to start handing and you are able to start loosening the reins on some of these projects mm -hmm. because the capacity is being built mm -hmm. um, within the government systems. And point certainly noted on retention. Um, in some of our countries, we've been facing challenges, strikes here and there, but certain, uh, uh, certainly a lack of enough skilled medical health care. And people leaving our countries sometimes, desperate to look for, you know, um, 
treatment. It is uh, living to go and look for for care outside, but also losing some of our ski, uh, you know people that we've invested in mm -hmm. to to other countries. To other countries. Yeah. Please look into the the camera, um, mm -hmm. Beatrice. And give your message to Africa. I will speak as a healthcare professional, and I will say that as Africans, in as much as uh, a lot of health issues are. Uh, controlled by the policy makers, um, ourselves, me and you, can uh, also make it better by creating um, the demand for these services. So if today I go for my HIV test, I am creating demand. And it means that tomorrow someone will need to offer me that HIV service. But if I do not go, then I will not create that demand. So individually, we need to create that demand. And this is a uh, I speak on behalf of, uh, uh, of uh, many organizations where currently we are trying to get people to come, but we shouldn't be trying to get people to come for testing, mm. for care. They should be coming and we are offering it to them. I would also want to ask that in areas where we have, we are, you know, the unfortunate cases where we have uh, conflict um, situations, um, that yes, all patients need, all people need uh, access to medical aid and uh, it, should be, it should be guaranteed to them. So we should offer safety to, we should be able to offer, to guarantee safety to medical workers who are working in these places and also to the civilian population that they can access health care. Thank you. That's in us. Very important. Create the demand. Mm -hmm. Use the services. Get tested. It could save your life. It's, it's that simple. But also to the governments, uh, to the policy makers, create safe passage for those who are making a change and saving lives on the ground, even in conflict, especially, especially in conflict situations. Thank you so much for your time. Great to have you. Thank you. Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. I'm Dr. Beatrice Kirubi, working with uh, Medicines and Frontiers, or Doctors Without Borders in Kenya, and you're watching Africa Leadership Dialogues. Heavy stuff there, and we thank Dr. Kirubi for sharing her perspectives. Time now to get your views on the issues. This week we asked you, within Africa, what are the key interventions that could ensure quality and accessible healthcare for all? Ben Gradita Navigator says, the government has to invest a lot in public quality healthcare in terms of facilities and manpower motivation. Sidi Taka says, Training traditional midwives and healers in proper practices at the low levels to save more lives. My name is Alan Adenya and I'm watching Africa Leadership Dialogues from Ongata Rungai. In my opinion, I think African governments should come up with a proper framework and policies to ensure quality and affordable healthcare to its citizens. Also, the government can come up with mobile clinics and ensure the cost of accessing the clinics is affordable. Also, if we weed out corruption in governments, we will ensure smooth flow of services in the healthcare sector. To join our conversation, go to our G Plus page, Africa Leadership Dialogues, on Facebook, Africa Leadership Dialogues, on Twitter, at Africa LD, and on WhatsApp, send your video comments to plus 254 715 816033. And now it's time for Africa's Top 10. On Africa's Top 10 this week, we look at innovative African healthcare startups. This is according to Ventures Capital for Africa. Starting us off at number 10 is Med Experts in Nigeria, founded by Stanley Aguo. It is an online community of practice designed for Nigerian healthcare professionals and the Nigerian public. Healthcare experts who use Med Experts can communicate share and collaborate on the platform on either the free or premium subscriptions. At number 9 is the Cardiopath Project in Cameroon. Founded by Himori Medical, 
The CardioPad offers nurses and cardiologists innovative methods for performing cardiac examinations and remote interpretations through a biomedical data acquisition processing and transmission process using the mobile telephone network. Coming in at number 8 is Mozambique's in Mozambique as the name suggests. Founded by Lorraine Thomas, Mozambique brings higher quality bicycles at a low cost to the people of Mozambique. In rural areas, bicycles allow people to access better health care as they can make regular visits to providers that are often located far from their homes. Positioned at number 7 is Medicram, which was founded by Tosan Adams and is used in Nigeria. Medicram Medical Records and Management is an innovative modular health IT solution that is intended to transform the way healthcare is managed by reducing the time patients spend in hospitals as a result of quicker and better access to their medical records and laboratory tests. Taking the number 6 spot, Asante Africa in South Africa. Founded by Edmo Mwakutuya, Sante Africa is a mobile app connecting doctors with patients, providing education to those who seek it and offering access to medical supplies at the convenience of your home. Slotted in at number 5 is ClaimSync in Ghana. Founded by Seth Akumani, ClaimSync is an end-to-end -end claims processing platform that enables hospitals and other healthcare providers to easily prepare medical claims and send them electronically to health insurance companies. Mobisure in Kenya, founded by David Kandie, comes in at number 4. Mobisure is a mobile medical insurance for low-income earners that provides families and individuals with insurance cover as short as one day. Mobisure plans to partner with small private hospitals, clinics, leading hospitals and hospital chains. Coming in at number 3 is Qua Water in South Africa, founded by Marcel Langisleg. Qua Water develops and delivers products and projects that significantly improve the quality of people's drinking water. At number 2 is Ruby Cup in Kenya, founded by Veronica Maxi Julie. Ruby Cup is an alternative menstrual hygiene product made of medical grade silicone that can be reused up to 10 years. Ruby Cup will be distributed through a network of women entrepreneurs in order to foster an intimate space where women can talk to women and girls about stigmatized issues and enhance education about menstrual hygiene. And at number one this week is Pender Health in Kenya, founded by Stephanie Coxilla and Beatrice Ongose. Pender Health is a social enterprise that provides health services designed for low and middle income women in Kenya. In 2012, Pender Health won the BID Network Global Entrepreneur of the Year Award and has already served over 1,000 patients. And that's Africa's top 10 this week. We close the show this week with a profound Ghanaian proverb, and it goes, A healthy person who begs for food is an insult to a generous farmer. I leave you to think deeply about that. Blessings to you and blessings to Africa.